So welcome to Shoreline Conversations. We're excited to have Pastor Keith uh, in the studio with us today, and we're going to be talking about love and what the Bible has to say about that. So without any further ado, let's jump into it. Well, welcome, Keith. Uh, I'm excited to have you here and be a part of this podcast. It's a it's a new thing for you, I think, right? I have never done this before, so uh, <laughs> set your bar really low. Oh, your no. expectations. Yeah, yeah. Man. So you you under promise, over deliver. That's that's what I always say. Uh, no, but uh, hey, I just I know that like. A lot of shoreliners have have heard you preach. A lot of shoreliners have have uh, seen you up on the platform. Um, but I think uh, for those that uh, don't really know you, or maybe people who are just listening to the podcast and don't uh, actually attend Shoreline, uh, can you just give us like uh, a basic background of like you, your family, and you've you've been in Monterey for a long time, and yeah. just what tell us about yourself. Sure, I moved to. Monterey or Pacific Grove specifically when I was eight years old. Holy cow. So uh, that's a long time ago. Really? Like that's a generation oh. or two. Man, that's a long time. Yeah. I'm old. A- anyway. Don't um, seem like so it. So that was in the early 80s. Uh, so I grew up here and uh, um, been in California ever since then. Yeah. So 40, 40 years I've been here. Oh, I just told you my age. Man, oh. I hate when I do that. <laughs> but anyway, um, I uh, graduated from Pacific Grove High School, cool. uh, went the, the long route to a bachelor's degree, took yeah. me eight years to wow. graduate college. So um, I made a lot of bad choices. Oh, wow. So that has a lot to do with how I do ministry now Yeah, because uh, I messed up a lot. And so <laughs> and so I'm glad that I'm past all of that. Yeah. Um, but I came I came to faith in Jesus here at Shoreline Church. So, That's so great. This I, church and what was means that like? To me. What like were, was that like a set up and tear down situation? Yeah. You were like how did you even get to that point? Like well, it was interesting volunteering? because I had a well I had a uh, my whole experience coming to Shoreline was interesting in that one of my childhood friends yeah. who was even worse off than I was. Um he invited me to church and so I was like, "Ah, I'll give it a try." Yeah. And so I'm like, "Well, if he goes, I must I must be able to handle it. Yeah. I can do it." And uh and so I did. And yeah, we were meeting at Pacific Grove High School in the gym and uh, it was a fun show. I loved yeah. coming in and watching the show and, and I sat in the back and and uh, went right, right around about yeah. my life after I left there all the same. But anyway, yeah. we had a, a service at the fairgrounds. And so, you know, that was an interesting thing. We did yeah. our church there and that was the day that I gave my life to Jesus. And uh, then I went from that to involved in ministry. Right. I started at Shoreline. Uh, managing the church softball team. That was my oh, big, man. that was my big thing. And now the, what was your the, record on the huh? softball team? Uh, well, we ended up winning. <laughs> and so um, it was an interesting thing. We won a uh, division yeah. and then we moved up to the next division and we won and moved up to the next division and won. And so it was, it was a real good, uh, good witness. We, we were really team, good. Just destroying yeah. people. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> well, it's funny because we started off the first year with three teams yeah, and we realized that we had diluted our pool, so we kind of oh, built some teams that were much better, and and uh, we were it was great. Oh man, yeah, it was great. So anyway, um, I've been married for 19 years and been with my wife um, for 24 years. Wow, and uh, I've got four kids. Holy cow, three that's daughters a whole gaggle and a of kids. Son. It is. They, yeah, they keep uh, well, they keep my wife busy. Yeah, you know? <laughs> she's just the one who does most of the work. Yeah, because, well. I'm, I'm here. You're here. Doing Quite a stuff, bit, you know? I've noticed. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, I've been working at Shoreline uh, since 2005. Yeah. So what do you do right now for Shoreline? So right now I'm called the Life Stages Pastor. <laughs> right now in this present day. Well, my my <laughs> job has probably changed more than anybody else's I agree. I've I, been here. In, in the time that I've been here. <laughs> it was like yeah. half the time of you. So so my, my title is Life Stages Pastor, which yeah. means I oversee um, the preschool's Kids ministry, middle school, and high school, mm-hmm. um, and then I have an odd added piece to that, and <laughs> that uh, that I serve as the CFO, uh, which means I handle the finance. And you've done that before, church. yeah. Like yeah. so, I got my undergraduate degree in finance, yeah. so it makes sense. It kind of fits, and uh, um, I've got a lot of experience in that. Yeah. And what I that's what I did when I was in the hotel business yeah. prior to coming into ministry. Yeah. So it, it works. It Classic uh, pastor wearing multiple hats that's situation. Right. Yeah. yeah, I feel like it's hard to avoid that, but yeah, it, it, it is the way it goes. <laughs> yeah. you know. But I, but I love it because I was in I was in operations for many yeah. years where it was kind of behind the scenes, not as direct hands on yeah. ministry. And so I love this because I got more relationship, more yeah. interacting with people. You know. Yeah, I think having kids too at that age, like, is there is there like a mental like uh, 
don't know, like a, not a refocus on like, like the a desire for that, that age range or, but I, I mean, that's got to have some effect. Well, it's an interesting thing because I, I definitely, um, care about my kids being yeah. in, in our, in our ministries. Yeah. And so that's a big deal. Um, but it's also a little odd because now my kids are in the ministries that I lead. Yeah. Right. And so when I'm, when I'm teaching at youth group, my kids are there, yeah. you know, and so um, that's always an interesting yeah. thing because I, I can't talk about my kids the same way no, when they're definitely. there. You know? and, and like, I mean, I've, it's got to be, in my mind, it's got to be distracting. Like if I say something on the platform and I'm giving like a, like a worship encouragement or I, or I say something about Mackenzie, my mm-hmm. wife, I'm like, I, it doesn't distract me when she's there, right. but it's de- I'm aware at this service she's there and the service she's not. And I may, I think about it, you know? Right. So I don't know. Is that, well, that's she, funny because yeah. I was uh, just yesterday when I was preaching, Yeah, I talked about the conflicts with our kids. Yeah. I mean, I have one child with a driver's license and one Yikes. with the driver's permit. Yikes. And I used an example <laughs> of fighting over the car keys. Yeah. And when I got home, um, my kids said, wait, she doesn't get to fight over the car keys yeah. yet. And I was like, well, it, it was just a general yeah. example. Yeah. I wasn't saying specifically and naming yeah. them. Um, but but I got called out on that and it wasn't even a main point of anything no, I was I saying. You know, so I got I to gotta be careful. That's funny. You know? I know. Uh, that's got to be interesting too. Because like, you know, when I'm talking about my wife, like, and I'm using her as an example, or I'm like, we're talking about like a, a thing that, you know, a conversation we had or whatever, like she's an adult and like, she's not my child. And she's not like, I feel like the high school age is kind of tough. You know, it's so, like, I can't imagine that's easy to navigate with your kids and like, yeah, kind of like the boundaries and stuff of being a, you know, in student ministries with your kids there. Yeah. It's an interesting thing. Yeah. But yeah. it's cool. I mean, you have like this investment into it. You Absolutely. Know, too, yeah. And I, and I have... Great reference points. So when yeah. something, when I get back home, I can say, so how did that go? Yeah, so what yeah, would you change? So what would you like to yeah, have? Yeah. You know, and, uh, are they pulling you know? the, the group too? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just, Hey, just go ask other people what, yeah, what yeah, we need yeah. to have happen. Don't, you know? That's funny. But don't tell them that dad was asking. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this Sunday you preached and you did a great job. It is, it is very encouraging word. So, uh, but we were talking about love. So, um, I kind of wanted to, uh, just, you know, we have some questions here, but just to start, you know, love is a, is a, it's a broad topic and it's a topic that I think, um, you know, uh, we should be definitely, uh, uh, talking about love in the church. And I think people talk about it, uh, throughout our world, but there is a specific, you know, like biblical description of love. And mm-hmm. so, uh, I kind of wanted to just have you kind of lay out like, your perspective and the way that you prepared for the sermon or this podcast, uh, and just kind of lay out like, you know, how are we going to define, you know, love for the remainder of our time? Great. Um, so yeah, love has a lot of different ways to describe it. And, and in the Bible specifically, there's, there's four different kinds Mm -hmm. of love that are, uh, that are mentioned or, um, actually two are mentioned and two just are there. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's Eros, which is romantic love. And and so that's written in the Psalms and it's written about relationships yeah. and that's a very different. So, you know, in our language, we have love and mm-hmm. that's really it. Um, and so they are, there's also Storge, um, which is uh, very seldom heard of. Yeah. I'd... And, and that's, that's Greek and it, it means familial love. And so when, okay. when you're hearing the story of Abraham and his family, mm-hmm. and that's yeah. really a big thing. So it's, it's not necessarily about actions or something that's, that's, um, it's just based upon the relationship mm-hmm. or, or Noah and, and his, right, right, right. his kids. Yeah. It's like, it's, and it's throughout, right? It's, it's all about that's built in when you have a family. Mm-hmm. And so then the two, those aren't listed like those actual words, Eros yeah. and Stoje aren't in the Bible. Right. But the concepts are, yeah, yeah. you see this kind of love that just like naturally yeah, yeah. Um, develops between parents yeah. and children and sometimes siblings That's storage. Yeah. Um, uh, and then two that are in the Bible are philia, um, which is brotherly love. Yeah. Uh, and that's probably the one that's most generally talked about within the Bible. Mm-hmm. And it's really about how we can, um, demonstrate our, our faith in there. Um, I wanted to read a verse, uh, yeah. um, John 13, 35 says by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you love one another, mm-hmm. Jesus was saying, if you philia, yeah. if you do this demonstration of love. And I think really 
as we talk today, I think that's the big part that we need to really settle on, that love isn't that feeling or that emotion mm-hmm. that we often get, get and it. associate with. There's it. action to it. Yeah, yeah. Like I really think it's it's beyond that. Um, and, and I think that love can can have an emotion or mm-hmm. a, a feeling to it. I, I can just think of when, you know, we talked about my kids. Yeah. You know, when I first had a child, they they didn't do anything yeah, to right. earn my affection, right. right? I just automatically loved them. I yeah. automatically had uh, feelings for them that were different. And there was a feeling. Yeah. Um, but but I think those feelings often fade, mm-hmm. you know, and if that's where your love is based, then when the feelings fade, yeah. so does the actions. And then the fourth kind of love is agape love. Mm-hmm. And that's God's yeah. love for humanity. And that's demonstrated in him creating us walking yeah. in the garden eat of eden with adam and eve yeah um it's a sacrificial ulti- love. right yeah and yeah. that's what i was gonna say it's ultimately the sacrifice yeah. right it's jesus dying for our sins yeah that's agape love and so when when we look at love we can look at those four big ones but I, but i really think that aside from those really it's love in action mm-hmm. um and i think more than anything today Um, loving those who are hard to love Mm -hmm. is probably the most, the biggest deal or the thing that we need to spend the most effort on. I mean, convincing me to love my wife pretty easy. Isn't that hard, right? Like she's the most amazing person in my world. Yeah. And so that's not hard. Uh, Matthew, um, Matthew five, 43 through 48, Jesus is talking. This is called the sermon on the Mount. Uh, And he says, You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Mm -hmm. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. I'm like, what? Yeah. Love your enemies? You know, that that's crazy. Like that I can't believe that's what Jesus call on us is. But then he continues on, he says, If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And the tax collectors were those that Christians would look down upon, totally. you know, those that they're they the would example. say, the bad yeah, example. like those are the bad, <laughs> yeah. the bad aren't pretty basically saying, aren't the bad people doing yeah. that too? And, uh, and he's like, you've got to do something different. Yeah. And, uh, if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that. Um, it's, it's the call upon us as Christians to, to love those people who mm-hmm. are hard to love and, and with so much conflict and turmoil and yeah. um, divisiveness and division, um, that's that's really that's really who who we're called to love. Yeah. You know, like I love you, and you're a Chargers fan, right? And we we deal with it as yeah. as coworkers. <laughs> right. We have to deal with that. Yeah. <laughs> well, especially today, I can f- love you yeah, a little bit well, better, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Context: Chargers <laughs> lost. Yeah, Spoiler the Raiders. Alert. The Raiders beat the Chargers <laughs> yesterday. So I love Cole more than usual. Today. Yeah, and I'm feeling <laughs> down. Uh, no, it's I. I don't give a rip. Um, uh, so no, but with that that kind of like brings me because I, I do want to talk about. Uh, I kind of want to save that the that discussion of of the practical, like how do we go into you know loving our enemies because that's a big thing that I think a lot of people struggle with. Um, and I think a lot of people would even disagree with it. I, I, I really do. So I do want to spend some time on that, but something that it, it brings in, into my mind is that the, we were talking earlier before the podcast, uh, before we were recording, um, man, the, the idea of unconditional love and, mm-hmm. and how, um, uh, how did you put it, Thomas? Um, uh, it's actually very conditional. Like it's, uh, it's often not truly unconditional, uh, and so, yeah, I just kind of wanted to discuss that. Like, what does it mean to have like true, unconditional love? Yeah, it's a tough one. Um, I think often if we really are being honest with ourselves, uh, it is conditional, it's conditional right? Yeah. We, we there's something has to be reciprocated. We mm-hmm. have to receive something back. But I, I truly believe that we're we're called to love unconditionally. Mm -hmm. And I think back again earlier talking about my kids and I think so much of my ability to grasp in a, an incredibly imperfect way, Mm -hmm. but grasp God's love and God's um, kind of plan for, for my life and humanity is, is the role I have as a dad. You know, if, 
if I love my children only if they don't have dirty diapers, yeah, you know, or if they only do the dishes as little kids, yeah. well, when they can't even walk or crawl, well, then I'm going to, I'm not going to be able to love them. Mm -hmm. um, but I, but I'm able to see past it at an early age yeah. and just love them because that's innate it's built in right because i've got that storge love you know mm -hmm. so it's just automatically there i don't yeah. have to i don't have to manufacture it or, or make it um, but i think so often we do put conditions on our love we do that with our children yeah. we do that with our our spouses mm -hmm. um, we do that with people in our neighborhoods our workplaces and, and even our and country you know that feels easier to like get like right oh well, yeah I, I get that but like the 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 f with your family, you know, with my wife, I, I recognize that, you know? Well, an interesting thing. It, yeah. Well, a big thing about what I think we're supposed to do is we're supposed to try our best to, to follow the example of Jesus. Mm -hmm. I, I really believe that for me in my life, trying to, through the strength of God, through the Holy Spirit, trying to become more like Jesus, yeah. I think is, is my goal. Mm -hmm. Like that, that's what I'm striving for. And I just think about him on the cross and he cries out to God, his father and says, forgive them for they know not what they do. Yeah. They're crucifying him. They're, they're, they're putting an end to his earthly life. And he says, forgive them. And I think forgiveness is a big part of, yeah. of what it means to be able to love unconditionally, yeah. to, to, to look at other people and say, well, Jesus paid the price for them too. Yeah. And so really, uh, any conditions that we set, I think are taken care of by mm -hmm. Jesus. And, um, and so to love unconditionally is to, to love no matter what's being reciprocated, no mm -hmm. matter what's coming back, whether it's love or it's action or it's compliance obedience mm -hmm. um it's it's not it's not that and i and i do think that sometimes um we we identify too closely love and um and actions mm -hmm. and, and i want to give you an example on that one because i'm thinking of my kids and again so much of my faith and how i do yeah. things is based upon me being a dad yeah um and i gotta tell you sometimes i have a consequence for one of my children because of some behavior yeah, that they did. Totally. Right. If, if my child were to get a speeding ticket, there's a good likelihood they wouldn't be driving for a while. Yeah. And they would r most likely look at me as not being loving in that moment. Yeah. Um, I have a, a child who re regularly wants to just eat cookies and ice cream. Uh, and if I was really loving, I would just have them eat cookies and ice cream all the time. Yeah. But the reality is it's because I'm loving that, um, that I set those boundaries. Absolutely. And so I do think sometimes we look at, um, love and, um, and, and we look at these actions and we mm -hmm. discount it or dismiss the love. Yeah. And so you can really love someone unconditionally, but have boundaries and have right. consequences and Absolutely. have, yeah. um, uh, have a way to navigate the relationship differently than just giving them everything that Absolutely. they want. And so loving unconditionally doesn't mean affirming someone's behavior. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't mean agreeing with everything that they do. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's uh, a key, a key piece in, in loving unconditionally. Yeah. And so I believe, um, and, and I preached on this yesterday, it says in, um, in Romans 13, mm -hmm. let no debt remain outstanding mm -hmm. except the debt to love. Uh, and what I think is so important about that piece is that that Jeez. means you got to keep going. Yeah. Like you, you continuously owe that. So how do you love unconditionally? It's by never setting an end to your love. Mm -hmm. And again, there, there can be boundaries. There can be, uh, there should be boundaries in, in all of our relationships. So putting boundaries doesn't mean ending your love. Mm -hmm. Right. If I have a child that goes down the path that I don't want them to, yeah, it doesn't mean I'll keep bailing them out of um, where they were. And like yeah. I said, it took me eight years to get through college because I did a whole lot of the wrong thing, yeah. you know. And and my parents didn't quit loving me, but they didn't bail me out of yeah. everything. I got in trouble, yeah. you know. When I got myself in in debt, they didn't say, okay, we'll fix it. You yeah. know, when I failed out of school semester, they didn't go and fix it. Yeah. They still loved me. Um, and they didn't base their love on the decisions I was making. Yeah. And so I think it's a combination of forgiveness and, 
um, and making a decision to continuously um, demonstrate that love. Yeah, that's such a harder thing to do. Like it's it's that's the I think there's also some like maybe not obviously not to the magnitude, but there's like some sacrificial love in that too. Cause like, wouldn't it be easier to like get the praise from your kid? You know, Oh yeah. wouldn't that be, but it's so much more self-serving, you know, than, than doing the more difficult thing and being like the disciplinarian. And like, uh, you know, I recognize that in myself now, like that I'm older when I was that kid, like, man, uh, there's hope. Cause I learned <laughs> so I, you know, I was that kid that like when I, you know, it wasn't a speeding ticket, but I got a ticket and I wasn't driving for a while. And I was just like, you know, it was devastating. And it was like the worst thing that could ever happen and will ever happen to me is I got my license and then I got it taken away from me by my parents. And I remember telling the argument like, Hey, if the government says I can have a license, then who are you to take it from me? But no, uh, but I, you know, you, you learn in life when you have those lessons given to you, you learn that like, Oh, that, that was done out of like care and love and, and a desire to, to see me prosper. And man, that's who I think there's adults that need to hear that to, man. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think, um, I think we get very comfortable mm-hmm. with being comfortable. Yeah. And we expect it to be comfortable. Yeah. And I think that loving unconditionally um, sometimes is uncomfortable. Yeah. It's making because, the right decisions right. out of out of love right. and not like just letting people do what they want so they're comfortable. Right. And then sometimes it's the other side, right? Sometimes it's demonstrating grace. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When you're like, no, 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 they really should have a consequence yeah, to this. Yeah, yeah. They're going to learn the wrong lesson yeah. if I let them get away with this. And uh, and I think uh, it's really about it's really about letting the Holy Spirit guide that. Because yeah. here's the deal in 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 our in our own abilities, I, I don't think we can do it. I don't think we really can love unconditionally yeah. because I think it's our nature to. To place conditions on things. Yeah, definitely. You know, um, and and it and it, there is a balance in there. And so, um, one of the things that I wanted to make sure to bring up uh, is a book written by Gary Thomas. Yeah. And it's called "When to Walk Away: Finding Freedom from Toxic People." The reality is that sometimes there's going to be people in your right. life that you you can't fix. Right. It's it says in in Romans twelve, uh, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, yeah. live at peace with everyone. That's saying you do your part. Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes there's an end to it because you just can't make it work. Yeah. And sometimes for the health of everybody involved, um, you, you you need to make a clean break. And so, yeah. um, Gary wrote a great book that's oh, a, yeah. a wonderful reference that that can help with those kinds of things because I, I know for me I'm a fix it person yeah and so I got to make it work yeah so I'm gonna keep trying and keep trying and keep trying and sometimes I I just can't yeah fix it and um and sometimes you can still love mm-hmm. right if I have a an estranged relationship with someone in my family. I really believe I'm going to continue to love them. Yeah. I, I believe that I'm going to continue to pray for them and to support them when they're making the right decisions. Yeah. Um, but that love doesn't mean I'm going to change just when they start making the right choices. Right. Um, but sometimes my actions might not necessarily, again, look like I'm loving them. Yeah. Yeah. We, I, I've had some interesting and challenging conversations with my wife about she's a, she's She's got her uh, PMP. She's a project manager, and uh, th- there was I remember having this discussion with her about like in in businesses and and uh, just in project management in in any business. It doesn't have to be you know you know nonprofit or anything like that. Just uh, there's that like there's like a cost benefit discussion in everything you know, and and it was interesting because it was like. Duh. Like if you really, if you really think about these, these specific things in like a business or whatever, there's, there's cost benefit to everything, every decision that's made. And, and the second you turn that into talking about your investment into people, like you get like, Ooh, like I shouldn't, like, we can't, we can't do this like cost benefit thing with toxic people. 
because they're people and you got to love them. But man, I, I love that book. I, I read when, and Gary came and, and taught here and man, how, uh, how profound is that to think like, man, there, there is a reality where it's just not, there's no reciprocation and you're getting nowhere. And you just go like, look, I, there's value in what I'm doing here for the gospel. Mm. And, and it's being put into this hole and they're just almost intentionally not receiving it. You know, it's, it's a, that was such a hard, challenging thing for me. Cause I'm the same way. I'm a fix it person. I'm a, you can't let this go. Like, uh, you know, you can't walk away from these situations and you can't like, but, oh, that, and it's still a struggle. I mean, it's still a struggle for me. Cause that's a, where's that line? Like, where is that line where you, you have to say like, I've done what I can do, you know? I know it's a pastor answer. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> prayer. Yeah. it's prayer. It's prayer. <laughs> it's allowing the Holy Spirit to lead yeah. you and guide you because I think the line isn't at the same place for, for everybody yeah. in every, every relationship. Situation. Yeah. It's just simply not. Um, you know, one of the things that I think uh, is a good uh, kind of analogy is our physical health. Yeah. You know, there's some times when we will pour into our physical health mm-hmm. and, and try to repair something. And I mean, there's times when doctors say, no, we got to just amputate. Like yeah. literally, yeah. this is going to do more harm, harm. maintaining than it is you know, if someone has diabetes or some other right. thing and they have to actually lose a, a limb, a foot, an appendage. It's a terrible situation yeah. when that happens. But sometimes for the health, that's actually what's best. Yeah. You know, you're going to uh, lose more. Right. You yeah. Know, sometimes it's better to gouge out your eye, you know, than to have it continuously bring yeah. you down, you know, uh, it's, it's a, it's an ugly picture, Yeah. Um, but sometimes it really is the best all the way around yeah. um, to, to remove those from you. Yeah. It's tough. And, and, you know, yeah. it's hard. Cause like, I think in, in, in society, you know, love is just like, it's always being, it's, it's pushed on us a lot. Like, you know, in songs like music and, in in television, like when was the last time you saw a movie about anything, about any topic, any genre where there wasn't a love interest, you know? Well, I got to tell you, um, in my home, it's currently Hallmark Christmas movie season. <laughs> it's and always so, Hallmark Christmas movie season <laughs> in my home. And so since July when they rolled out like 30 <laughs> new um, movies, that's all it is, oh, right? Yeah. Not only is it part of it, that is the the whole thing. Yeah. But, but I think, well, they're fun and they're enjoyable. Yeah. The reality is that those movies or... The songs, it's always about a feeling. Yeah. Like they don't ever take it past that. And it's so often any... sexual too. It's not even, it is, you know. Right. And and yeah, I just feel like so I feel like, and I think we, again we were talking about this earlier with, with Thomas and I man, it's like it's been the concept of love has been, I wouldn't say like completely distorted, but it's just been like uh really focused on like one aspect or one like level in one plane. And when you look at the biblical, you know, realities of, of the word love and how different languages have like different words for the same thing, you know, uh, and it's easy for us to just like, kind of not just, it's such a, you know, the, the, it doesn't mean anything anymore. The word doesn't mean anything anymore. And, and so I just, I guess, you know, when we're, looking at the Bible's just depiction of, of the word love, like how do we take that step back and have like that new, like, or not even new, but like a fresh perspective on the old realities of that word, you know, and how, do, how does it, how do we gain meaning back to it? You know, when it's just been pummeled. Yeah. It would, man. It's, that's, a, it's so, it, that's a big question. I know it's so hard. Um, and, uh, um, one of the things that I think often happens, uh, one of my favorite things uh, in in all of that I do is um, premarital mm-hmm. um, preparation with couples. Yeah. And we get to talk through marriage and what it means and how to have a successful marriage. Yeah. And, I, and I hopefully um, am used to help equip them. But one of the one of the things I concepts I try to instill in them early on is that real love puts the other person's well-being above your own. Mm -hmm. I ask every couple when they come to meet with me for the first time, why do you want to get married? And inevitably they talk about 
what the other person does for them. Yeah. They make me feel good. They make me feel valuable. They make me feel like a prince. They make me feel like a princess. Um, they're always there for me when I need it. Mm -hmm. They, they support me. They encourage me. And, and while all that stuff is good, I truly believe that when we go back to unconditional love, mm -hmm. that, that that's conditional, right? Yeah. That's conditional yeah. love. It's because of what they do for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, when, when, when we read in Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, mm -hmm. Christ died for us. He didn't say, I'll do it once you get yourself figured yeah. out and cleaned up. Um, and so again, I think it goes back to trying to follow the example of Jesus and trying to be more like him. I actually think also very practically speaking, it's not using the word. I, I know that's maybe just semantics, but it's, it's not using the word loosely. Like, yeah. like, don't say, I love carne asada burritos. <laughs> you say tacos again. Yeah, tacos. Watch yourself. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think when we, when we don't use the word that loosely, yeah. um, because again, I think love is about action. Mm -hmm. And so I think from an early age, we, um, we teach our kids I think sometimes, I know I do, yeah. to use the word inappropriately mm -hmm. and using it too frequently. Uh, I, I tell my kids often, probably not as often as I should, I want to show you that I love you. Mm -hmm. And I want to step back and, because I tell my kids I love them yeah. all the time. Yeah. Like they're probably getting tired of it, you know? And so, because it's all the yeah. time. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Um, but I want to show them. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes I make that clear. Here's what I'm doing. I'm showing you that I love you. I don't want to be doing this right now, but I love you. So here's what I'm doing. When you took her license away? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, right now when I'm building a chicken coop for my daughter oh, I know. and yeah. the playhouse, um, most days I don't really want to do it. Um, but I also think that love is, is and, I, and I don't want to take away from my point that it's Love is action. Yeah. But I also believe that love is attitude. Yeah. And so I think it's it's how you're approaching it. And again, the I know it's a pastor Christian answer, but it's through prayer, it's through pursuing God, it's through yeah. spending time in, in the Bible, it's through singing songs mm -hmm. that remind me of of what love. It's through looking at the example of Jesus and yeah. and what he did. Uh, did for us. And so I, I do think that we can even do some actions that that people would look upon as loving mm -hmm. and it not be about love. Um, in, in 1 Corinthians 13, it's a whole chapter yeah. about love. And it says, if I speak in the tongues of men or angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. Mm -hmm. If I give all I possess to the poor. So even if we care for the poor, which most people would say, well, that's a clear demonstration of love. Um, or uh, give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not love, I gain nothing. Mm -hmm. Love is is more than action. Yeah. Right. It's more than feeling. It's more than action. It's kind of this all encompassing. Yeah. Love is action is feeling is attitude. Yeah. Um, and, and so, um, when I do a wedding, um, at the end, I usually quote first Corinthians 13 mm -hmm. and, uh, and the end or, uh, verses, uh, four through seven, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Yeah. And I and I challenge the couple mm -hmm. to replace the word love with their name. Yeah. And And when we do that, when we have these reminders, and I think that's the big thing, in, in order to redefine what love is, we need to replace it with mm -hmm. something, right? So we can't just say that's the wrong definition or that's the wrong picture of love. We've got to say, but here is the right picture of right. love. Right. The right picture of love is kindness and is um, patience, Yeah. right? I mean, that's so hard. Yeah. Um, but that's that's just what we've got to yeah, do. Yeah, when I've, I've done a few uh, weddings 
too, like I've officiated and, and uh, uh, I've, I've used that verse in a different context. I've, I've pulled it out and I've used it as a list, like, and, and, and I describe it as like a, uh, this is actually a list of, of the attributes of God. And like, I think, he, you know, we're hearing that from mm. you too, where, where ultimately when you're saying like, you know, love is more than the way it makes you feel. Love is more than the way that, you know, you, uh, you act, but it's like this all encompassing, you know, and you want to say like, it kind of shapes who you are. And then when you take that further and you look at like a verse like that, and those are the attribute attributes of God, we're saying we're, we're made in the image of God and, and we need to seek to be more like Jesus. And that's the, you know, so it's a, it is an interesting, like, you know, reminder for us that like truly, uh, what does it look like to be more like Jesus, more like Christ? Uh, and it's, you know, your life shaped around the idea of like this holistic, all encompassing idea of love. You know, it's, it's tough though. <laughs> and, and, I'm, and I'm glad, you, and I'm glad you say that it's tough because I want to make sure um, this doesn't in any way look like we're painting this picture. No, it's, Todd, you just go do it. Like, yeah, why not? Like, it's an easy thing, right? You just pray, you just read your Bible, you just sing songs. Yeah, bam, you're done. You're loving. Yeah, it is hard. I mean, it. I do not have it figured out at all. Um, there are so many days when I don't feel like I have mm-hmm. anything left to give. Mm-hmm. And yet I'm supposed to love you know, yeah. when, when my dog needs to go out one more time. Now I'm not talking about loving my dog. I'm talking about loving the rest of the people in my family because I got to get up and take <laughs> yeah. out the dog so that no one else has to do yeah. so. And last night was one of those nights yeah. and I was like, Oh, that's right. I just preached on this today. I got to get up and take out the yeah. dog for the third time in an hour or what it was yeah. 40 minutes. Like, yeah. I don't know. She was having some kind of issues, but yeah. anyway, <laughs> It's, uh, it's, it's hard. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, and I think that it's a uh, we You've probably heard this before. We say that we don't have to teach selfishness. Right. Like as, as early as our kids can start talking, they're saying mine, yeah. mine, totally. mine, you know, gimme, yeah. gimme, yeah. you know, we, we, that's just our, that's our, our broken human nature, yeah. right. In that we're selfish. Mm-hmm. Love is the, the opposite. That's right. The antithesis. It's, it's, it's the opposite of being yeah. selfish. It's being selfless. And so it's a constant battle. Mm-hmm. And and we can't do that in in our own strength and in our yeah. own ability. It just it's not possible. So then cause I this is a question that I I, I have my opinions about and it, I think it's a little bit of a mixed bag, but I I think it's it's fair to say or to ask the question, do you think that the world sees Christians like, I mean, kind of as a whole, you know, like you, you say you subscribe to this thing called Christianity and when a, a person that doesn't, when they look at you and your life or, or when they just look at Christianity as a whole, do you think that they are saying yes or no to like, we're a loving group? Unfortunately, I think they don't. Yeah. And, and I think it's hard because it goes back to my parenting. Yeah. I think when Christians talk about rules or guidelines Mm -hmm. or commands of God, they're received as commands of people. Mm -hmm. And it's hard when you're not in, if I have my own family rules and I try to put those family rules on my neighbors, right? They're going to go, why would I do that? Like that's, that's not, that's not what we do. Yeah. And that's a hard thing when, um, when as Christians, we have a set of guidelines, you know, we, we believe that, that God has given us some instructions for mm-hmm. how we should live our life. Yeah. Um, and when we share those with the rest of the world, they are often received as hurtful or hateful yeah. or condemning or judgmental. Yeah. Um, when, when they're not, yeah. um, but that's how they're perceived. And I, and I do unfortunately think that too many Christian voices that are heard mm-hmm. come across that way. And I think it's hard. I, I think that the Mother Teresa's of the world yeah. don't get a whole lot of airplay. I don't think that they're seen, you know, no. those who are out there, you know, caring for people and um, feeding the homeless and taking care of the ones who are in dire need. I don't think that they get a lot of attention. Mm-hmm. 
Um, we get sound bites from one person here and there. Literally you know, Mother Teresa. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so we get these sound bites that I think paint the wrong picture. Yeah. You know, we, we have, um, again, we have rules to live by, yeah. but they're for our good. Yeah. You know, we have, we have rules in our, in our nation that are there for our good. And one of the probably most common uh, illustrations is speed limits, mm-hmm. right? Like we have speed limits and stop signs and all of the other driving regulations, in fact, to protect us. Mm-hmm. That Those are the reason we're... I think they should be raised there. like five miles per hour <laughs> more, like in general. We yeah. just lift it like five and I'd be happy. Well, in my neighborhood, they just did. <laughs> they did? You know, in my neighborhood, they just did. And what's interesting is that a lot of people are now complaining. Yeah. Like, why did you raise the speed limits? Well, because there's all kinds of crazy laws. And they say, we have to raise the speed limits based upon how fast people are driving. And so a good, uh, on Imgen, um, people are driving 50 miles an hour. And so they did their tests and they said, okay, we've got to make the speed limit 50 miles an hour. I don't understand all of that. But anyway, my whole point being, <laughs> my whole point being there's a grouping of people now right. who are saying we shouldn't have done that. Yeah. Because they know if we lower the speed limit, people are going to be safer. Like we put rules in yeah. place to protect. God has put rules in place mm-hmm. to protect. But it's hard when it feels like what we're saying is we're just trying to control you. We're trying to to curtail your fun. Mm-hmm. We're trying to you know change the way you live your life. Um, and again, I think it often comes across that way. Yeah. And that... Um, rules that are family rules, or we want to say this is what God's best is for you, yeah. um, get received as us being judgmental, us coming up with the rules, us making demands of other people. Yeah. And uh, the reality is, as we've been talking about loving, that it's hard for Christians mm-hmm. to love. It's hard for Christians to follow the the commands, the, the guidelines, the rules yeah. that God has set forth. It's going to be even harder for those who don't know yeah. Jesus, who don't have the Holy Spirit, no, who aren't yeah. who aren't in the family to to necessarily follow these. Yeah. Um, and again, I think it, I think that there's just too few who um, whose voices are heard, mm-hmm. and so it just comes across negatively. Yeah. You know? Yeah, because I I mean I even. I have friends that wouldn't say that, that are Christians that wouldn't say like Christians as a whole. And I think there's a little more inside understanding of like, you've got to, you've got to accept the fact and the reality that you can't escape is that like we're sinful people. And so uh, just because someone pursues a perfect life of health doesn't mean they maintain it or they, right. or they ab- attain it, you know? And I, I think, uh, I think that's a, it's a hard thing to, you know, I think when you critically think about it, you can like, you can, you know, pull back like the, the, the cliches and the, the major talking points. And you can realize that, that we're, we're still sinful people. Right. Like we're not, we haven't transformed out outside of that because we've accepted Christ. We've just received forgiveness for it. And we're seeking to live a life of love and that like Jesus. And yeah, it's tough. I, I it's a bummer, but I don't think we're going to escape that. No. Well, I, here's the thing is that I think we can on a case by case basis, yeah. on a relationship to relationship basis. Right. And that's a big thing about our church and organic yeah. outreach. It's about the relationships that we build. Yeah. We're not going to change the image that the media puts out there. Or again, even people that post things on social yeah. media, yeah. we can't control those. Yeah. We can on a one-on-one basis not be judgmental. Mm-hmm. We, we can be loving. And again, we didn't say, Hey, everything you did was the right thing. Yeah. You know, I've, I've gone to court with, uh, too many of our college age students over the years, you know, as they yeah. had made decisions to do something wrong. And, uh, and I didn't affirm what they did. I didn't yeah. make the right decisions, but I said, Hey, you know what? I will support you in yeah. this. You know, I, I actually had one guy who asked me to pray for him. Uh, and I actually prayed that he'd go to jail. Uh, he's like, no, 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 stop praying. Stop, stop, you know? stop, stop, stop. And I was like, but if I care for you, you know, and his issues was he was involved in drugs yeah. and he actually needed that break. Yeah. You know, unfortunately the judge didn't see so and he <laughs> let yeah. him go about his business. But, but on the one-on-one cases, I don't think grand scale, we, we're going to change it. Mm-hmm. I, I just, 
I think that there's too much against yeah against the church um not as uh, not an overt uh, i'm not going to go into this conspiracy that everybody's trying to be no, in the no. church but uh, there's too much out there already that yeah, i yeah. think i think it's about the one-on-one relationships it's the single interaction well and those have i think you're i absolutely agree and i think those are the ones that have like you know a lot of weight to them again i i know non-christians and christians that like have a hard time like navigating that reality of uh i think people have a overall like when you get like a lump sum they just decide that like we're maybe not a loving group and it's, you know i guess the that the pastoral way to say that is just hey just be more loving yourself and be the change that you want to see and but i mean what else i mean well, you know i think a big thing is again the starting point i think if if our desire is to love mm-hmm. so we go all the way back to the beginning what is love if our desire is to actually love like we really want to do it mm-hmm. then i think our approach is different moving forward i think um our um our fortitude, our, our perseverance, Mm -hmm. you know, the steps we'll take are different. If we really feel like we really should love or like that we want to. Yeah. Um, forgiveness is a big part of love. And I, and I think again, back to Jesus on the cross said, forgive them for they know not what they do for him. It was just like built in. I need to forgive. Yeah. Um, I think for a lot of us, we don't even start with that as a, as a, framework or mm-hmm. a foundation that we need to forgive. And so I think that's that's missing. But I do think that we all could agree with the golden rule, yeah, you know, yeah. or what Jesus said, um, love your neighbor as mm-hmm. yourself. Uh, and he's quoted with those words a few different times in the gospels on Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, but he said, love your neighbor as yourself. And I think really if we approach others that way, then I think we're on better footing and a good foundation yeah. to start. But I but I think we often don't. I don't think we would always or even often say, oh, no, this is how I would love or I'd, how I'd want them to love me. Um, I, I don't think that's really what we're saying mm-hmm. when we do something where we're, we, we don't go through that kind of. Um, filter to say mm-hmm. is like if, if if we really do that yeah if i say these words if i do this action if i let's do something as simple as if i call my friend and say can you help me move a couch mm-hmm. and they say no i'm not going to help you move a couch i'm not going to be oh great you know i i sure wish yeah i sure wish they would yeah right and so flip it around the other way. And I say, so my friend calls me and said, hey, can you come over here and help me move a couch? And I'm like, oh, I really don't want to. Yeah. And so I go, uh, no, I got stuff I got to do. And so I, I, I don't do it. Yeah. I think if, if I stop and say, if I were the one making the call, what would I want to have happen now? Now, yeah. you can't go help every person move a couch. Yeah. Right? That's, that's just not, it's not realistic. Yeah. But I don't think... I know for me, I don't, when I get that phone call, I don't think, I do sometimes, but I don't think all the time. Yeah. What would I want to have the response be? Yeah. And if that were the way we approached it, what would I want the response to be in this moment? Yeah. You know, when, when you get in a, a disagreement with someone, mm-hmm. you already know what you want to have happen. Yeah. Right. Like, cause that's why you're in the argument, yeah. you know, but if you're, if you're on the other side yeah. and you go, what would I want them to do to me? You know, yeah. what would, I think if that was our mindset, if that's how we approached it, yeah. um, and it's hard, right? Because we're, we're, we're selfish, and so we don't necessarily think about the hypothetical yeah. me. We think about the actual me in mm-hmm. this moment. Um, and I think that um, that if we could do that, if we could put that into practice, that would be helpful. Yeah. Some of those, like the argument, I would be terrible at that. I just, I'm so like focused on like, I'm right and you're wrong. What do you, you know, I just, I don't know why I'd, it's hard to, it's hard to, you know, step out of your shoes and jump into someone else's for me anyway, an argument, but I could definitely see that. Like when you're, when you're on the fence about those things, like the couch thing, I'm a truck owner. So like that yep. question gets asked <laughs> me a lot. So, uh, yeah, I, uh, 
it's tough man because like i am that guy too though i like helping people do stuff like that like you know i uh you know i'm definitely the guy that's like uh you know call me if you need anything like call me, you know if you, if you guys are out of town like do you have a spare key i can like watch over your house like you know but there's sometimes people ask me i'm like gosh i really don't want to do that and like but i'm normally that guy so they're asking me for a reason so like i i tend to have to well that's when i think you really need to do it i know right i can tell you that's for me right yeah it's not when it's easy yeah it's when it's hard yeah that's when it's a true demonstration totally. of love you know yeah. when it's super simple yeah then you're not really making a sacrifice yeah. you're not you're just doing what's natural to mm-hmm. you i i think for me i get so much out of helping people yeah that there's probably some selfishness in there yeah. like hey i was able to come to their rescue yeah. that was the knight in shining armor and right? and it shows because hey, i'm not i'm not trying to call you out or anything but i know that you're also the guy that doesn't ask for help yeah i do i don't ask for yeah help. so i i think there's something to be said about yeah. like those two like realities is because i'm i'm similar i i honestly am similar uh i i don't like really you know reach out to people like beyond my uh like scope of like people that I'm interacting with all the time, like my really tight friends and, and family and stuff. But like, you know, there's something to be said about that, you know, where it's maybe not, not self-serving by being the helper, but like there is some, you know, there's some joy in, in being that guy that like, Hey, I was able to do something and help somebody. Well, yeah. When I was building this playhouse yeah. at my, in my backyard and I had to place the four by eight roof, five yeah. eighths inch roof panels up yeah. on the roof by myself. Yeah. I was thinking, man, it sure would be nice to have someone <laughs> else to help me with this. Uh, instead, I built some kind of contraption so that yeah. I could like hoist up one side and then you're push willing, up the you're other willing one. to spend money on other materials <laughs> to do, you know, it's so funny. Yeah. Oh man. It's tough though. I mean, I think, I think, you know, uh, in general, I, I, I don't want to like imply that like, love has to have like that like painful like sacrificial thing but like i mean a lot of times i feel like it does like yeah yeah i mean there and there's levels to it right and and not everybody you know uh another book that i that i love and it's an interesting thing because for me this is a um it's kind of a jump here, but the five love languages by Gary right. Chapman. Yeah. Uh, and, and my point with that was being for some person, it might be a sacrifice right. and for someone else. It's not right, right, right. right. For me to say something nice to someone, <laughs> Gary Chapman calls that words of affirmation. Yeah. That's a huge sacrifice. Yeah. Like that's, that takes work. Like it takes way more work than yeah. me driving across town and helping someone move a couch. To me, that's easy because because mm-hmm. my language is acts of service, mm-hmm. right? And so that's just naturally who I am. Yeah. And so depending on what the way of communicating that love is, it's going to be a different uh, a different level of sacrifice. Yeah. Like I can I can do the dishes at home all day long, but I can't. No, <laughs> no. no. <laughs> but like if I need to like plan a date with my wife, yeah, I. I have such a hard time, oh, really? it, you know, cause that's just not in my realm. Yeah. Um, and my wife would rather write a nice note or plan yeah. that date. Like it's just a different way mm-hmm. of expressing that love. And so depending on what the need is, it'll be a sacrifice for yeah. some people, um, and not for others. And, but I really believe that it's when it is the sacrifice that, um, that that's when it's a true demonstration of love. Mm-hmm. And I think, um, and back to the, the love languages, I think we often, uh, we think about love your neighbor as yourself. You're like, oh, and what, what I would like to have happen is this act of service mm-hmm. when, um, when what she, my wife, for instance, right. she actually wants the quality time, yeah. you know, I'm like, but wait, if I'm supposed to love her the way I'd want to be loved, yeah. I'm loving her as myself. I want acts of service, you know, and I think the big key in all of that is that we often have to adapt our love for our audience, for the person we're in relationship with, that they're not all going to want the same thing. And it's not going to demonstrate to each of them um, that I've got one child. She just loves hugs. Yeah. I got another one who's like, uh, don't hug don't me. touch me. Like, yeah. leave me alone. Like, you're in my bubble, you know? Yeah. And so if I just said, well, everybody loves hugs, I'm going to yeah. just demonstrate my love by hugging. 
I'm actually not. I'm I'm actually annoying yeah. the other one yeah. by doing that. And so we need to be able to adapt Can, the way we show our love. I it's uh, I'm I'm just as you're talking, I'm like thinking, does that like because I agree. I agree that like it's uh Again, I think it can be self, like you're you're saying I'm a acts of service you know kind of person so I'm gonna like but they don't want the that to be re- like they don't want to receive that like what so you you change and you and you uh, act accordingly you love on someone accordingly but can that like perpetuate conditional love? Huh? Yeah, kind of I good. Mean, I guess it could. I guess right? I. I mean. I don't um, know. I, I I'm just throwing that out because I was thinking about that. And I was like, man, I I guess you'd have to like have like a you like have like an understanding that like yeah well I don't know. you know I, I i think a lot of it has to do with what what needs to be achieved i just thought of a, a weird analogy but yeah. <laughs> say someone is like in a desert and they are just dying of thirst yeah and you give them a steak like it's not helpful it doesn't meet their needs in any yeah. way right like they're dehydrated they don't need a steak that would make it worse they're not going to be able to swallow the yeah. steak right because you put a bunch of salt on it when yeah. you tenderized it Amen. and oh it is not going to be good for that butter butter yes yeah. oh that's yeah. good garlic, <laughs> garlic butter or just regular <laughs> whatever butter? whatever yeah. you want yeah um but um but they need they need water they yeah. need hydration yeah and so depends what we look at our focus uh if our focus is meeting their need where they are then um, then I don't know that it's conditional as far as we're not expecting mm-hmm. anything back. Yeah. We're just changing. So you can look at the conditions um, of where yeah. their situation is, but I don't know that that's considered conditional yeah. enough because we're not asking for anything back. Right, right. You know, if my if my wife needs to spend quality time with me, I can spend quality time with her simply because I want to show her how much I love her and value mm-hmm. her. And I'm not expecting anything back. So it's unconditional. I'm yeah. not saying give me anything back in return. I'm not telling you to do acts of service mm-hmm. for me. I'm saying I'm going to just do this because this is what will show you mm-hmm. that I love you most. And, and so I think that we often, again, we want to express our love in the way that is natural to us. Yeah. And we don't see what's natural to the other people yeah. and, and what what would really communicate it to them, you know, um, I'm a sarcastic guy. Yeah. Right? Banter <laughs> is a, is a thing, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, um, some people feed off that, yeah. right. And we can harass each yeah. other. Like I could go to someone else who's a charger fan yeah, and, yeah. and harass them about yesterday. And they're like, why would you beat yeah, me down? Like mean. you're going to kick me when I'm yeah. down. <laughs> right. And, and so yeah. I've got to be able to to figure out what their right, right, right. what their language is and what's how they communicate yeah. because that doesn't work for them and yeah. so we've we've got to be aware that different people communicate differently and and so we got to meet them where they are yeah you know? so speaking of of unconditional love this is kind of like the the cap to this that I want to talk about like uh, ten years ago uh, you know your message would have been. Um, warm hearted and and you know uh definitely biblical and true and, and you know but it would have been like this light you know fun like you know love people like but i feel like we're in a different world now than we were and you know i mean you we're seeing things whether people are portraying it as a joke or or if they're actually alluding to like civil war you know as christians what you know, this idea of unconditional love, how, how does that, um, there's just so much division right now. And there's so much like opinions and, and there's so much, there always has been, but there's, there's like so much pressure to be a part of a single group. And like this, this constant painful, battle mental sometimes even physical we've seen uh you know what's our responsibility as christians with this idea of like unconditional love and and yeah there's just uh there's just this growing like sense of like you have to be part of this group or that group and this uh what do you call it uh uh tribalism, tri- tribalism. Yeah. you know what's our role in this mm-hmm. Well, I think as Christians, our role is to fix it all. Amen. Yeah, right. We got to just Amen. come in and we got to just get to the bottom of Amen. it. Uh, 
back to the Sermon on the <laughs> Mount that I've referenced a couple of times. Um, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, mm-hmm. for they shall be called sons of God. Mm-hmm. I think... I think the idea is for us to change what a win is in our world or what our, our yeah. end goal is going to be, right? And I think that so much of it um, hinges on us trying to bring peace. Mm-hmm. And so if if our goal is to, to try to bring people together, yeah. again, just like with the perception of Christianity or Christians, changing it on a global scale is going to probably be a near impossibility. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I truly do believe that God can do whatever he wants to do, that yeah. he does have that power. Um, but within our own abilities, I, I see that's a really difficult thing. Yeah. And so I, I think what we do is we we change what our goal is, and it's to bring peace. It's to bring a lack of division. Yeah. Um, and I think a starting point is to not be part of perpetuating that, yeah. right? Not being part of making that worse. Yeah. Um, I got to tell you, like I've had some difficulties, right? Yeah. So right now the, the political climate in our country yeah. is off the wall, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's crazy. The division yeah. and the, the animosity, the antagonism that's there. Yeah. Uh, and I've tried a few different times, um, to open the eyes of people about, yeah. about their side, mm-hmm. um, and and it didn't work, right? It didn't, yeah. it didn't go the way I would have hoped. Um, for some reason, I thought maybe they'd say, "Oh, I, I hadn't really thought about it that yeah. way," you know. And 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 for for me then to go to the other side and say the same kind of thing. Yeah. And I'm the interesting thing is that I'm a I'm a I don't really I don't attach to to any of the sides. Like mm-hmm. I don't I don't feel like um, adhering to one political party or another is beneficial. I love what pastor Kevin says. I'm, Mm -hmm. I'm a biblical Christian. Like I I love that whole idea is that, that I don't attach myself to platforms, Mm -hmm. um, but it's to individual causes as they pertain to, to the Bible and to what God's plan is for us. But I, again, I think that it happens on a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. I think that um, if we know people who are really, attached to their their tribe right mm-hmm. their their grouping of people uh, and it can be a lot of different groupings right it could be a political grouping i mean it, it could be a community it could be an, an ethnic group there's so many that we can attach to yeah but i think that when we know those people personally we can try to come alongside them and help them see something different yeah um, and then we have a different approach to someone who's a Christian and someone who's not a Christian, mm-hmm. right? If they're someone who's a Christian who we have a relationship with, then, you know, we believe in our faith that we are to challenge one another. Yeah. Um, it says Proverbs, um, in Proverbs, it says, as iron sharpens iron, mm-hmm. so one brother sharpens another. I believe that it's our our call to challenge one mm-hmm. another and to hold each other accountable and yeah. to, to help each other in that. Um I think the problem is that we maybe often try to do it on a grander scale. And and today, I think the biggest uh, tool yeah. or platform is social media. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Here's what I want to say. Don't go with the social media route, right? It's like yeah. that, that's not going to be the way help. to do it. No. Um, but one thing I also think that really works with a lot in our in our world, in our thinking, uh, our, our, our paradigm, so yeah. right, the way we view things is to replace what we want to not be there right. with something else. Right. So I, I do think within social media, you could do something, right? Mm-hmm. Like I think that you could replace the negativity, the division, yeah. the, the disparity um, with positive, yeah. with with good stories, with mm-hmm. um, biblical um, context that that could be helpful, yeah. and uh, and I think that if we try to do that, it can be helpful. Mm-hmm. But but here's the deal: I also ultimately think that it's not on us to bring a full resolution to yeah. this. Right? I, I I go back to Romans twelve. Um, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, yeah. live at peace with everyone. Uh, I believe that we have a a role that we can play. I believe that we can make a difference. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I don't think we need to, 
give up and say we can't make a difference because we're not going to change yeah. anything. Um, we uh, I, I've read this story a few different times, and I'll probably get the the things wrong. Yeah. Um, but I think it's a great picture. Father and a son are walking along the beach, and there was a bunch of sea stars that had washed up on the beach, mm -hmm. thousands of them. And this kid goes and picks one up and throws it into the ocean. And uh, his dad's like, what are you doing? And he says, I'm throwing them back in the ocean so he can live. And his dad goes, you can't save all of them. It doesn't make a difference. And yeah. he said, well, it made a difference for that one. I just threw back in. Yeah. I, I love the idea of us making a difference for one, mm -hmm. right? If we can help bring healing to one person. Yeah. And we don't know what's going to come from that. There could be a wave that, mm -hmm. that comes from that. And then that person is healed, is is brought closer to the other side, is brought closer to Jesus, uh, more in line with God. Yeah. And then who knows what happens with their relationships and what conversations they have with people. Yeah. And I think that, that through that, um, we can help bring healing and help mm -hmm. bring peace. Um, but it's like this, right? This is conversations, right? Yeah. It's about having conversations. Yeah. It's, um, and the context matters. Like, without a doubt. You know, I feel like, I feel like, uh, you know, we can't avoid discussion, but also like, I, I hope the two of you don't mind me saying anything, but like the, the conversation that you guys were having, you and Thomas were having, before we started recording, I like that felt so healthy to me, you mm -hmm. know? And I, and I was just kind of listening, but, uh, mostly cause I don't have a lot to say on it, but, <laughs> uh, but like, I, no, I, I just, I really do think that like, man, there's context there. Mm -hmm. There's, there's, um, privacy, there's, uh, you know, long-term established relationship, uh, whether that's personal or like, you know, work affiliated, uh, but there's like this, this context of, of who you're talking to, how you're talking to them, mm -hmm. where you're talking to them, who's listening. Like, I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's a thing that we need to like, there's, there's that context of like how you're going about like discussing this stuff and, and, uh, the way that you discuss it with Thomas would probably be very different than you would discuss it with, you know, a friend at a restaurant, you know? And, and then also just, man, less divisive, you know, like, I mean, is that what we're doing nowadays? Is like the better option is just being less divisive. I, the peacemaker thing feels so good to me, you know, like, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I don't know. How do you do that tactfully without being like uh, patronizing? I guess I don't, yeah. I don't know. You know, it's it's uh, it's tough. I mean, it's, yeah. I think uh, it says in Hebrews twelve, pursue peace with all men. Um, I, I think it's it's being proactive. Yeah. I think so often um, we either yeah we either bring division um, or we just stay out completely. Yeah. And, and I think that. If we're actively pursuing it, we're, mm -hmm. we're seeking to um, to bring reconciliation, yeah. to bring healing. I think that's the start. I do yeah. believe that having conversations is the start. And again, yeah. I, I really do believe that social media isn't the place to have conversations because conversations don't take place. Right? Yeah. Memes take place. Um, echo chamber takes place. One sided support me and argue takes place. Um, but conversations like real yeah. conversations, real discussions, uh, having this kind of conversation, yeah. um, where you openly talk about the things that are, that are difficult, mm -hmm. um, I think opens up the doors, um, for people to be reconciled, to yeah. bring healing. And, uh, uh but ultimately I, I really do believe that it's found in Jesus yeah. and that that's where the healing comes from. I think as people are introduced to Jesus, mm -hmm. I believe it doesn't fix all of the problems, right? Because we're still human and we still bring our own experience, our yeah. own personalities into it. Um, but I think so often we try to just fix the problem yeah. when we forget that Jesus, and again, I know that's a, uh, that's no, a pastor it's... answer is Jesus. <laughs> um, when, when people were trying to get me to to leave drugs and alcohol behind. Yeah. They kept talking about the drugs and the alcohol. Yeah. I can tell you today, now that I'm well past that, yeah. what I needed was Jesus. Yeah. What I needed was Jesus in my life. And mm -hmm. that's what led to that. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't feel like what I was doing was wrong and was hurting me in any way. Yeah. 
And so you we weren't going to convince me of yeah. that. And I think so often we're trying to convince people um, that that's of, bad for you. Right. Yeah. And and that's not what they need. They need they need Jesus. And as they have a relationship with him, as they begin to pursue that faith, that Christian faith, mm-hmm. I think it helps. Again, I don't I don't think it fixes everything because even within the Christian church, we see yeah. division, right? We see um, um opposite viewpoints bringing conflict Absolutely. in within the church. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't ultimately get rid of it all. But I also think we don't sometimes feel like it's okay to have a difference of opinion. Yeah. Uh, and I really believe that we do. I mean, we can look in the Bible and see Peter and Paul, you know, at odds yeah, over yeah. about how to do their ministry and they didn't see eye to eye. Yeah. And, you know, we believe in the, the Christian church that those were two incredibly influential yeah. leaders in the church who have helped the Christian church be what it is today. They helped spread the good news of Jesus mm-hmm. across the world. And so they had their differences. And um, and I think that's an okay thing. And uh, we just need to be okay with there being a difference of opinion. Um, and, I, and again, I think if our goal is to convince someone else to agree with us Mm -hmm. or to see it our way, then I think we're going to constantly be at odds. Um, But if, if we want to try to open their eyes, if we want to try to bring peace um, and then through that, I think reconciliation can take place. But again, I I do believe it's on a, it's more of a one-on-one basis. It's through conversations. It's through openness and humility. I think that's a big one too, right? I think so much of this conflict is, is pride driven. Yeah. yeah. I'm right. And you've got to see it my way. Yeah. Um, and when we can go about things humbly, I think it, uh, it opens up the doors for, for so much more. Yeah. And I think like true humility, I've heard people say like, let me, <laughs> let me try, let, let me understand why you think you're right. Like that's not humility. You know, <laughs> like I, <laughs> I avoid that. Right. But yeah, I mean, again, there's, there's, there's a lot to be said about, you know, context and and you know who you're talking to what you're talking about uh, it's uh you know you're always navigating like how you're going to go about something I, I i think i think people want peace people want you know people want things to just cool off for a minute you know and like i it's so important so we really need to i think people are willing to try things and i, I man i i would encourage everyone He's listening, man. Be a peacemaker. That's the, oh man, we need, we need that more than anything right now. So, Hey, uh, I wanted to ask you, um, uh, those book references. Cause mm-hmm. I, I, um, if you can just fire those off again, cause I sure. think those are really valuable resources for people right now. Um, yeah. yeah so the five love languages yeah. uh, by Gary Chapman, again, yeah. that that's a tool that can help us, um, see how we can possibly meet people where they are. Yeah. Um, because I do think that practically speaking, when we talk about love, it's about taking steps mm-hmm. toward loving. It's about, um, you know, a simple act on a daily basis, yeah. you know, depending on who we're interacting with. Um, and then when to walk away, finding freedom from toxic people um, by Gary Thomas. Yeah. Um, Cause again, I, I think sometimes, no, I know without a doubt, yeah. sometimes the best thing to do, is to walk away. It's a hard thing for us, especially yeah. as Christians, because we we feel like that can't be loving. Um, but the fact is that we could be hurting ourselves, the toxic person we're dealing with, the people in our spheres, yeah. right? If, if I have a relationship with someone that's toxic and then I bring that home into my family, it starts impacting my kids. Absolutely. It could ultimately be impacting my grandkids and yeah. my great grandkids who I don't have yet, right? So like, I don't even have that yet, yeah. but- it's an important thing for us to be able to look at. And then one book that I, I net, didn't even bring up earlier, yeah. but, uh, but I think is great because I talked about the four loves. Yeah. Uh, C.S. Lewis wrote a book called The Four Loves. Yeah. And so uh, he's a whole lot more intellectual <laughs> than me, and he could really break down those yeah. four loves and how they are uh, in the Bible. But I yeah. think that that's great. Uh, and then ultimately, I think the way forward is to practice unconditional love mm-hmm. with simple uh, steps, a simple act, yeah. um, on a daily basis. If we see it each day, how can I demonstrate love mm-hmm. to someone, 
whether it's someone in my family, someone who's easy to love, or I think again, in, in today's climate, it's the person who's hard to love. Yeah. It's the person yeah. we don't see eye to eye with. It's the person that we disagree with. It's the person that's maybe antagonistic to us. Mm -hmm. You know, the person who's really, really hard um, to, to love. If we take uh, an act on a daily basis yeah. to reach out to them, I, I think... I know that could be transformative for both them, us, and then our relationship yeah. together. Yeah. Yeah, Keith, I appreciate it. I Thank you for, uh, I know you invested a lot of time and energy into this sermon, but also just the, this discussion, it's been, it's been good. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you for, uh, you know, this is, this is conversation, you know, right. I, I think that that's good too. That I feel like people can look to, to things like podcasts and, and, uh, where people are interacting with others on like that, that like one-on-one -on -one basis, but it's like being published, you know, right. and to take that and like put into practice, you Absolutely. know, like just talk to people and, and, uh, do with humility, kindness, love, patience. Um, it's so important. So thank you for investing into this. Thank you for uh, taking the time to chat with us. And, uh, I really appreciate this. So thank you. Great. Whether you're watching this podcast on the YouTube channel or listening on your podcast app, make sure to subscribe to hear our weekly episodes. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week with another one.